Um, I'm Susan Weller, the director of the University of Nebraska State Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you all tonight uh, to the Center for Great Plains Studies. Let us begin by acknowledging that the University of Nebraska is a land-grant institution with campuses and programs on the past, present, and future homelands of the Pawnee, Ponca, uh, Jouer, and Atoy, Missouri, Omaha, Dakota, Lakota, Kansa, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples, as well as those of the relocated Ho-Chunk, Sac and Fox, and Iowa peoples. The land we currently call Nebraska has always been, and will continue to be, an indigenous homeland. Please take a moment to consider the legacies of more than 150 years of displacement, violence, settlement, and survival that brings us together today. Thank you. This acknowledgement and the centering of indigenous peoples is a start as we move forward together for the next 150 years. As part of the centering, education is going to help us move forward together. The museum is partnering with the Center for the Great Plains Study to bring together a panel to help us all learn about the Genoa School and the work that is occurring to document the hidden tragedies and lost lives that took place at this Indian boarding school. I wish to thank the Claire M. Hubbard Foundation and the Paul A. Olson Foundation for supporting tonight's event. Trustee Dr. Hubbard is here tonight, and thank you, Anne, for the Foundation's generous support. And although he could not be with us tonight, I do wish to thank Chancellor Green for his leadership and for constituting a Native American and Indigenous Advisory Board to guide the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Several members are in the audience tonight and online. And if you are here, would you please rise and accept our thanks for your service to the Chancellor and UNL. And I know Judy is here. And Anne is here, and there are a couple of others, so thank you. I will now briefly introduce our panelists and ask them to greet the audience here and online. They will each present, and at the end of their presentations, there'll be a moderated Q&A session. And online viewers, please drop your questions into the Q&A link or chat. And in this room, um, I will call upon you and recognize you uh, so you can ask your questions. I'd first like to introduce you to Dr. Rudy Mitchell, who is an enrolled member of the Omaha Indian Nation of Nebraska and Iowa. He is a retired professor of Native American Studies at Creighton University. He has a doctorate in counseling psychology and has worked 35 years on two Indian reservations here in Nebraska. He is a formal chairman of the Omaha Nation and direct descendant of Chief Big Elk of the Omaha Nation. He is also a Vietnam veteran. Thank you, Rudy, for your service and for joining us tonight. Please feel free to introduce yourself to the audience. Um, Dr. Rudy Mitchell. Um, 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 you know, I'm an elder of the Omaha Nation. I'm 81 years old. It's customary for me to introduce myself in my uh, native language. It's part of our culture, and I want to do that this morning. Um, I'm sorry, this afternoon. Um, you know, today's uh, Veterans Day, and uh, I took part in some of the uh, activities in the city of Omaha. Uh, Veterans Day, but if there's any veterans out here, I want to acknowledge you. I served during the uh, Vietnam uh, War in the Army Medical Corps, uh, as many uh, Native Americans have done in the past. 
But I'm very um, honored to be here today and to be part of the uh, panel here tonight. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Ms. Judy Gash Gabash, who is an enrolled member of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. A graduate of Doan College, she has served as Executive Director of Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs since 1995. Judy works with the government and private sector to provide opportunities for Nebraska Indians, foster diversity and cultural sensitivity. She has done this in the Nebraska State Legislator, Legislature. She's promoted state and federal legislation and advanced sovereignty issues. She was the 2012 recipient of the Humanities Nebraska Sower Award. She served on countless nonprofit and institutional boards. And her vision and commitment to celebrating the stories of Nebraska's native heroes and youth education are simply inspiring. Most recently, she led the initiative to install a statue to honor Dr. Susan Picot Lafleche, the first Native American women doctor who now stands not too far from us on the state capitol grounds. Thank you, Judy, for joining us tonight. Please feel free to introduce yourself further to our audience. Thank you, Susan. It's really a pr pleasure and an honor to be invited to be a part of this panel and to talk about the Genoa Indian School and this uh, dark part of our country's history. I am a, a survivor descendant of the Genoa Indian School, as is Dr. Rudy Mitchell. Our mothers both went to the Genoa Indian School, as well as two of my mother's sisters. And every day, uh, more and more, I feel so fortunate that my mother survived the school, as we know, so many didn't. And today, I was um, visiting with my daughters on Veterans Day. I, too, want to acknowledge all of the veterans in the audience, and especially our Native people who serve at a higher rate than anyone in the United States to protect our homelands. And so uh, I had the day off as a state employee, and I was um, communicating with my two daughters, and my two daughters never met my mother. She uh, died before I had my daughters, and I have five grandchildren. And my one daughter texted me and said, I had shared some sad news that you'll hear here tonight, uh, that we have found more of our children that died at the school than we thought. And she said, Mom, I'm just so thankful that your mother made it out of that school alive. So I'm not gonna go into too much. Right now we're just to introduce, correct, uh, who we are. I am honored to be the Executive Director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs starting my 27th year. And um, in our culture, it's an honor to be an elder. And I am an elder. And I'm, uh, I, I'm happy to be an elder. And I'm so blessed by my family, uh, those uh, my descend, who I descend from, and those uh, my grandchildren. And I look forward to visiting with you more about our story and um, everything that we're going to learn tonight. We blow. Thank you, Judy. I now wish to introduce Dr. Susanna, uh, jo oh, I'm sorry, Galiga? Galiga. Galiga, who is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and is of Taino descent. She received her PhD in history with a specialization in ethnic studies and her MA in history with a focus on Great Plains study from UNL. Her primary areas of research are the histories of Native American women and the construction of Native American identities in the early 20th century. She founded the Little White Buffalo Project, a Lakota language and cultural preservation nonprofit. She has been active nationally and internationally with the preservation of languages and cultures of indigenous peoples. She is co-director for the Genoa Indian School Digital Reconciliation Project here at UNL. Thank you, Susanna, for joining us tonight. Please feel free to introduce yourself further to our audience. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Lila Yahibicha Iumashkinaha Iuha Nepet Chusapi Wachin. 
I'm said good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm so excited to see all of you, and I would like to extend a warm, heartfelt handshake to all of you. And it's so good to be home here at UNL. These are my stomping grounds, so it's good to be back here. Pilamaya, thank you. Dr. Elizabeth Lorang is Associate Professor of Libraries at UNL, where she directs and contributes to a number of digital humanities activities. She is the principal investigator of the NEH-funded project Image Analysis for Archival Discovery, directs the Digital Scholarship Incubator, and co-teaches the Digital Humanities Practicum course. Liz is a co-director for the Genoa Indian School Digital Reconciliation Project here at UNL. Thank you, Liz, for joining us tonight. Please feel free to introduce yourself further. Great. Thank you, Susan, and good evening, everyone. Um, thinking about how I might introduce myself uh, today, I think what I wanted to share most is that so I was, I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, and I went for far too much of my life not knowing about Indian boarding schools, and it took leaving the state for me to learn about them. And it took even more of my life uh, before I learned that we had a boarding school here in Nebraska at Genoa. And now, um, in my role as a librarian, I realized that access to information is always a way of structuring power, and that my mission now is to use my role and expertise and my position to address historical and contemporary imbalances in information power. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Margaret Jacobs. She became the director of this wonderful center in 2020, and she is the Chancellor's Professor of History. She is the author of three books and over three dozen articles, most of which focus on the history of indigenous child removal by the governments of the United States, Canada, and Australia from the late 19th century up to the present. Thank you, Margaret, for joining us tonight and for hosting us. Please feel free to introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, it's really an honor to be with you all tonight and with all of you in the audience as well. Um, I am a non-Indigenous person. I'm a settler, um, and I wanted to become involved in uh, researching more about the Genoa Project after I attended the final ceremony of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015. That very moving experience led me to think, what could I do as a scholar? Uh, how can I use what resources and skills I have developed as a historian over the years in the service of indigenous people? And so I'm very delighted to be here and honored to be here with my fellow panelists and all of you. Thank you. Okay, now what you've really been waiting for, which is for all our panelists to talk about their areas of expertise, and um, I believe, Susanna, you are leading us off, and you all have control. If you need me to do anything, just call on me. Certainly. Well, the idea of boarding schools originated from a Colonel Richard Pratt, who at the time was also known as an Indian killer. And in the 1870s, he had acquired the responsibility of looking after some Native American prisoners of war at Fort Marion in Florida. And after a while, he felt like he could re rehabilitate them by cutting their hair, having them wear, making them wear military uniforms, maintaining a military style regime, you know, requiring them to learn and speak English and, um, you know, to force them to attend church. And after a while, he found that he thought this, his, his, uh, program, his, it, it would be successful, his focus. And so he approached the, um, he petitioned actually the government to fund the first Native American boarding school in 1879 in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And he very quickly um, accrued a following of some influential groups such as former abolitionists and white women, women reformers who in turn turned around and pressured the government to fund more Native American boarding schools. And so 
eventually the government ran, uh, opened and ran about 153 schools throughout the country and various churches also operated about 200 schools throughout the country. And so up to about um, World War II, uh, uh, boarding schools just, they were so common, they became a part of Native American life. And by 1900, 78% of Native American children, 78% were taken away from their families, ranging from ages three, five, seven onward. And in many instances, you find stories where there were even babies at these schools. And so, um, what, um, uh, oh, sorry, I just lost my, my train of thought. And so even though, you know, the government eventually by the 1930s and the 1940s had closed many of the schools, after World War II, there were still many uh, f schools that were still functioning throughout Indian country, particularly with the uh, Navajo people and the Alaska natives. And so, um, you know, when people are learning about boarding school history, you know, some of the common questions are like, why boarding schools? Why not day schools? Why not schools that were close to the reservation? But, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, this very, complex and expensive boarding school system was part of you know a government a, a assimilation policy that was intended to strip native peoples of their unique cultures their languages you know their claims to the land and their sovereignty so you know why you had these officials trying to figure out how to you know, uh, take care of this Indian problem or these, in, you know, problems, you know, of Indian people and coming up with the idea of how to, or coming up with the plan to take children away from their schools. You also had many settlers who were claiming that the Indian problem was Indian poverty and their dependence on the government. You know, but in reality, it was the government and settlers that were impoverishing Indian people. So, you know, when they when when they were talking about the the problem of Indian, they're the Indian problem. You know, what they were really talking about was the fact that Indians had persisted, and that they were still asserting rights to the land and to their sovereignty to religion and to their diverse cultures. And so, you know, there were many um, horrible aspects of boarding school, but I think the most horrible would be, was to strip children from their families. And so, you know, there were native families, some native families who willingly sent their children to boarding schools, but there were many, many, many native families who resisted having their children taken away from them. And unfortunately, you know, that resistance was met by, you know, the government force of the military and of police and sometimes just outright starving people by denying them their rations that were guaranteed to them by treaties. And that's a thing that many people don't know um, that happened to native families um, for children that were, you know, sent to schools. So good evening again. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, how the boarding school system played out at the Genoa Indian School. The Genoa Indian School operated for 50 years from 1884 to 1934. It enrolled children from 40 different tribal nations, ranging in age from four to 22. And it started out as one building on 320 acres and grew to over 30 buildings on 640 acres. Its peak enrollment was in 1932 with 600 students. The school was originally built on lands that had been uh, uh, negotiated by the Pawnee Nation in a treaty in 1857 that established a Pawnee reservation along the Loop River in central Nebraska. And the Pawnees had negotiated for a reservation school. And this operated from 1866 to 1874. 
But the Pawnees, as many of you may know, were exiled from Nebraska to Indian Territory by 1875, and the school closed for a brief time. In the 1880s, the U.S. government chose Genoa as a site for an off-reservation boarding school because it was several days' ride away from the nearest reservation, and they saw this as an effective way to sever the children's ties to their families, communities, and cultures, and thus to assimilate them. Upon arrival, school officials forced children to have their hair cut, give up their native dress, and wear uniforms, and they forbid the children from speaking their languages. I have to give you an aside and just say, I'm, it's so thrilling to hear three native languages being spoken tonight um, and to know that despite this assault on native cultures that indigenous people have persisted and they've kept their languages alive. Genoa, like other boarding schools, was run on Pratt's military model. Students were divided into military companies based on their age and gender, and they had to participate in marching and drills every day. Students learned reading, writing, and arithmetic only in the morning. In the afternoon, they were, were required to attend vocational training or labor for the school or work for local families. And boys engaged primarily in agricultural work and some trades, while girls did domestic work. And students did a lot of labor at the school. They grew and prepared the food, they did the laundry, they made their own uniforms, they even built employee housing. This was important training, but it was also incredibly exploitative, and it was child labor. The government only allocated $167 per year for Indian students, which was far below what they compensated states for non-Indian students in this era. Genoa closed in 1934. The federal government deeded its land and buildings to the state of Nebraska, which used it as a penal colony until 1944. In 1949, the state gave the site to UNL for a seed farm. UNL proceeded to raise or raise, R-A-Z-E, <laughs> raise or auction off most of its buildings and lands. In 1990, volunteers in the city of, Nebraska, or city of Genoa established the Genoa U.S. Indian School Foundation, and they raised money to buy the manual training building in order to create a museum and interpretive center. This building is on the National Register of Historic Places, and you can visit it today, and I'd really encourage you to do that. The foundation has been working to make Genoa in the interpretive center and museum a real place of healing. They have sponsored reunions of attendees and their families since 1990. And we work really closely with them on the Genoa Indian School Digital uh, Reconciliation Project. Forty tribal nations have sent flags to the foundation's interpretive center to represent their children. So we started a digital project for the Genoa School in 2018, and we'll return to talking a little bit more about what that has entailed. But first we want to hear from Judy Gayashkabash and Dr. Mitchell about what Genoa has meant to their ancestors who attended, their families, and their communities. You know, um, my mother attended Genoa and when she was at the age of 10 years of age from 1911 to 1914. My mother was an orphan. Her mother died um, uh, at the age of 19 or 20 in the city of Omaha uh, from diabetes. And her father, who was happy, couldn't take care of her. So she was raised by her grandparents. In our Omaha culture, you know, when you're an orphan, uh, you're probably one of the most, um, you know, um, pitiful person, you know, within the tribe, you know. And um, from what my mother told me that um, her grandfather, um, Spafford Woodhall, wanted her to uh, try and get an education. So um, she was sent to Genoa. Um, my mother attended three boarding schools throughout her young, young days in life. Uh, she went to Genoa, like I said, from 1911 to 1914. From 1914 to 1917, she went to Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. 
And from 1917 to 18, she went to Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas. You know, all these years, my mother raised eight of us children by herself. My father was an alcoholic, and she divorced him when I was about three or four, so I never knew my father. But um, my mother never shared any of the negative things that went on in the school. She talked very little about it, and I don't know why we never did really question her, you know, why. She did speak some of the good things that uh, actually at Carlisle, she um, really enjoyed going to school there. But getting back to Genoa, she did share a couple of stories there. She said that um, when the Omaha Indian children uh, arrived at uh, Genoa, they were all young. When they would gather together, they would speak their Omaha language together. And if they were caught, you know, their, um, the um, staff of the Joe Indian School would wash their mouths out with soap. So that discouraged them from speaking um, the Omaha language, she said. And she said that she was always hungry, and she said she could never eat fast enough at the um, uh, dining hall. And she told her one story where in the morning, she said they were having biscuits and gravy, and uh, she uh, couldn't finish you know, the biscuits and gravy, so she stuffed them down her breast to take them back to the room so cause she could eat them later because they were on a time frame where they only had certain time to eat and then they had to do other things but she shared that with us. Um, another thing which I thought was real sad, she said the um, Omaha children would all gather when they were not in school or doing you know, um, chores or detail. They used to call work detail in a lot of the boarding schools. She said they would gather at the railroad tracks, all of them, and they would talk among themselves and they'd look east back towards you know, the reservation and stand there and cry, she said that they uh, wanted to go home, but it was too far away for them to go home. But um, they, uh, she said it was you know, um, very difficult and very hard at Genoa to adapt, you know, and um, she said a lot of the um, you know, young people just you know, suffered a lot of emotional um, you know, abuse there as far as being away from home. But I wanted to share that with you as far as you know, Genoa. I think my mother could have shared more I do want to share more on in, in the 60s of what happened, but I'll let Judy talk a little bit more about her mother. Um, but um, we were both saying it, it's we were fortunate that our mother survived, otherwise we wouldn't be here today, you know, because, you know, after hearing all the um, horror stories of what went on in Canada about all the young children dying up there, and probably at all the other schools too, um, it, it, we're fortunate, you know, to be here today. But I, um, I'll share a little bit. I, I went to a boarding school, and I'll share some of my experiences at the boarding school I went to. But I'll let Judy share some things right now. Thank you, Dr. Rudy. Oh, wow, there's so much to say. Uh, I don't really know where to begin, but I guess I'll start, kind of go back to the beginning and talk a bit about my grandfather, uh, who was the last chief of the second rank of the Ponca tribe. And he was born in 1878. And you heard that the Carlisle School uh, was the first boarding school built in 1879. And for me, I think of life a lot in the context of my tribal history. So uh, Standing Bear, the Ponca Chief, the trial of 1879. And that's when Carlisle was opening. Uh, we were forcibly removed and taken to Oklahoma, and I heard Dr. Jacobs say the Pawnee were exiled, and that's sort of a sanitized version to me of forcibly removed. They had no choice. They didn't want to go. They had to go. And my dear friend, Dr. James Riding in, who is um, a revered Pawnee elder, recently retired as a tenured professor at ASU, he co-chairs the Genoa Digitizing Project with us. And, he couldn't be here tonight, but I do want to uh, say a word of appreciation and thanks for James' uh, friendship all the years that I've known him. We were friends before I became the director of the Indian Commission, and uh, one time we were back at a reunion at Genoa, and he said, uh, we were at a dear friend of mine that lives there, uh, Ann Burke's home. She lives on a big ranch, and uh, we spent the night at her home, and James said that was the first time he'd been on Pawnee homelands. 
because uh, the Pawnees were forced out of there. So uh, what I'd like to say is, um, I hope not too harsh, but sometimes the truth is harsh. And the boarding schools for Indians really had a hidden agenda, and that was to steal the land, 90 million acres of land that were uh, taken from us. And so at the time of the Dawes Act of 1887, that's when the government systematically decided that the best way to free up all the land was to divide the land. So my grandmother and my, or my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother and my grandfather's brother, they were given uh, some of the first allotments along the Niobrara, right up the river from Standing Bear. I have a map in my dining room that shows that. And um, so uh, my Standing Bear died in 1908. My grandfather was 30 years old at the time that Standing Bear died, to kind of give you guys a timeline here. So we got this land, but today our family doesn't have that land. It's all gone. The Ponca tribe doesn't have that land. We are slowly buying back the land. And as you know, our story, uh, not only were we forcibly removed and standing bare at the trial, we became recognized for the first time as humans, not citizens. When my mother was born and Dr. Rudy's mother, we weren't citizens. Uh, they weren't citizens of the United States of America, just like Dr. Susan LaFleche Pacot wasn't a citizen, even at the time of her death. So um, I might have lost my thought here, but I'm going to try to get back on uh, task here. Uh, going back to that time period, my mother had uh, seven sisters and a brother. There were nine children. And my grandmother, my Santee Sue grandmother, I'm in Roll Ponca, but I'm Santee, my grandmother, uh, she didn't have to go away to boarding school. She went to the Santee Normal training school that was located on the Santee lands. And that was less detrimental to her culture. She was at the school during the day and got to be at home at night. And so my grandmother, who lived with in my home um, until she died at the age of 86, I shared a room with my grandmother and my sisters, and I have 10 brothers and sisters. Uh, my grandmother was a fluent speaker of her language. She did not have that beaten out of her as um, many of our people did at the Genoa Indian School. So while my mother was there, uh, her two sisters, my mother was the eldest, and they went there partly because they would have starved if they didn't. And as um, Susanna said, uh, they threatened our people, if you didn't send your children, you wouldn't get your rations. So parents were really left with no recourse. What could you do? So they thought by sending the children there, they were at least giving them an opportunity to be fed and also to get an education. So half the day they learned the three R's and the other half the day they learned how to do a trade because it was a self-sufficient school and my mother was one of those people. She was, um, uh, let's see, I don't know if I want to use the word slave. Uh, she learned how to bake. She uh, worked in the kitchen. You had to learn everything. She wasn't a good seamstress. They were very, very harsh and rigid on the children. And uh, if you didn't do a good job of sewing your, the clothing that you wore, uh, you were punished for that. Uh, luckily, my mother was good at baking, <laughs> and she made the bread, et cetera. And that's what she did until a week before she died to uh, support uh, my brothers and sisters. I grew up first generation off reservation in Norfolk, Nebraska, and my mother moved there with my grandmother uh, before I was born, and she cooked and baked in different cafes all of her life. So like Dr. Rudy said, many of the students, my mother and her two sisters, didn't get to be in the same room because they would have communicated in their languages. So they were separated, and separated from their parents. So they were missing out on learning about what it's like to be a family. And they also couldn't be with their own uh, language speakers. That was a way to kill the Indian and destroy the language. And that was really, really sad and harmful to our people. Uh, like my grandmother, she didn't have to do that. So, um, however, they didn't succeed. <laughs> my mother went back home 
uh, to the reservation and she became uh, elected to the tribal council when white women weren't doing that in America. Uh, women didn't have the right to vote and didn't get to do a lot of things. When my mother went back home, she, and I learned this after she died, I did not know uh, that she did that because I think I look at the soldiers, I call these little children, this was the last Indian war fought in America using our children to kill the Indians and free more land. So um, my mother got to go back home and she didn't die. Uh, she made it out of there, but she did go home with PTSD and she did go home with deciding not to tell us all those painful stories and uh, protect her children from what she had to go through. And she tried to always teach us to take the best and leave the rest philosophy, and she did learn some good things at the school, and that's partly why she survived. She was able to survive the beatings and the lack of food, being hungry, uh, wearing clothes that were uncomfortable, a uh, hairstyle that you weren't used to. You didn't get to sit in a circle and sing and talk to your relatives like they were so used to doing at home. And um, so she, they chose not to tell us a lot of the painful, just like soldiers, today's Veterans Day. Soldiers go to war, they see horrible things. And my mother saw, I'm sure, maybe her sisters being beaten and others. And when you see others harmed, that's even more than harmful than being beaten yourself oftentimes. So I have really mixed feelings. I wish my mother would have told me more but I was 19 when my mother died, and you just don't ask questions to your elders. In our culture, we respect our elders. My grandmother, she told me more because she lived longer and she wasn't as damaged by her life experience as my mother was. So I think uh, we have a lot of Native people in America that are walking wounded warriors, and I see myself as a survivor of that, and every day I just, cannot believe uh, that I'm alive and I'm so thankful that I get to do the work that I do and I'm dedicated and committed to serving the rest of my life to find those children that are missing at Genoa and do something good with the harm and the pain that happened there. And I have a lot of ideas, but I don't want to dominate the panel here, so I'm going to turn this back over and I have a beautiful poem that I want to read if we have time that my friend Suzanne Schoenharjo sent to me. I emailed her today and her great great grandmother went to the Genoa Indian School. So I communicated and said, I'm going to be on this panel, do you have any good advice? She sent me this poem, she said I could read it and so if we have time, I will. And if we don't, I'll have it posted somewhere that you can all see it because it really Suzanne's a beautiful writer and a brilliant woman, and she says some of the things that Dr. Rudy and I want to uh, say in a more eloquent way. So with that. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to share with you, um, you know, my mother, when she went to Carlisle Indian School uh, from 1914 to 1917, uh, she really liked the school there. You know, um, my mother must have talents because they taught her how to sing, and play the piano there. Uh, and, and she was even offered a chance to go to the Juilliard School of Music. And I used to tell my mother, I said, Mom, just think if you went there, I said, you would probably married a non Indian. You'd probably been in society. And she looked at me a long time. She said, Oh dear, she said, I would never hedge all your children then, she said. <laughs> but um, she, um, for some reason, she liked Carlisle. I, I think they were good to her. But I, you know, in between the lines when she would talk, I could see some things, you know, when she was what they called sent out during the summer months when they weren't in school to live with families. And I think they, they probably served as servants into non-Indian families out there. Uh, they only got like four to five dollars a month for uh, working for the uh, non-Indian families. But um, she said she tried to save up the money so she could come back home to uh, Nebraska during the holidays and all this. But um, I, and like Judy was saying, you know, with our elders, I'm an elder now, and you know, we never question our elders. We never ask them, you know, why this, why that, and all that, you know. 
uh, kind of wish my mother would have, would have said more as far as what really went on. I'm going to share, uh, just this past week, I interviewed a, a young lady that, uh, well, she's not young, she's in her 60s now, but who went to a um, religious uh, boarding school during her grade school and, and high school. But I'll share briefly with you. You know, I went to Haskell Institute. It was um, um, a high school for Native American people. Um, when I was a freshman, uh, going into become a freshman in Macy and, and on the reservation, northeast Nebraska, our high school burned down. So we had to go to the nearby town, and that was Watabago, the Watabago tribe. And I just didn't feel comfortable, you know, going there as far as you know, being in, like an outsider or stepchild. So I uh, talked to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the education person there. I said, I want to go to Haskell um, in Lawrence, Kansas, because I want to get a better education. I, I had dreams of going to college. Um, I was turned down the first year. The uh, school would not accept me because they were only accepting students from Oklahoma and from the Southwest. People, uh, student uh, tribes from Nebraska were supposed to go to Flandreau, South Dakota, to another boarding school up there, and, and I didn't want to go up there. So in the, um, my sophomore year at uh, Winnebago, I told the um, education officer, I said, I'm going to quit school if you don't send me to Haskell. And um, he managed me to get me in for late enrollment in October. And wow, when I think about this now, I don't know how I ever did it. You know, my mother, I never did travel outside the reservation. I had been always just on the reservation. She took me down to um, Lawrence, Kansas, uh, Haskell. And, um, it was really a culture shock to me to be away from home. I remember she stayed overnight down there. The next day she was going to leave. And I was in the dormitory and I looked out the window and I saw my mother. She was going towards catch the city bus to catch the bus come back to uh, Nebraska. And I ran down the stairs to try and catch her because I thought, I want to go home. I don't like it here. <laughs> but I couldn't catch her in time. And uh, she was gone. And I thought, oh, well, I, I guess I'm going to have to stay. But you know, my uh, three years at Hasco, um, there was no physical or mental abuse, anything of that type. You know, there was something like 1,200 students here, close to 1,000 in high school, close to 100 different tribes. I made a lot of friends. You know, nowadays you hear about high school students, you know, all the, um, the social ills that go on, you know, drinking, smoking, drugs, and all that. Nothing like that ever happened at Hasco. Uh, nobody drank, nobody smoked on campus. We all got along good. I made really good friends, um, uh, you know, students from Oklahoma, and I still remember a lot of them and all that. But I finished uh, high school there. The only thing that I regret as far as attending school there was I, I wanted to go into medicine. I had dreams of becoming a medical doctor. They didn't teach chemistry there. And even when I was taking one of the American history courses, I thought, I wonder why they're not teaching us Native American history, Where, where's all the um, tribes that, you know, that were involved in, you know, different parts of this country and all this, you know. But uh, nothing was taught in high school, you know, as far as, you know, Native American history was going on. But I um, wanted to share that with you. I'm going to share, you know, some, um, uh, you know, like I said, I interviewed a, um, a, 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 a she's an elderly lady now. And I'm not going to sugarcoat what she told me. Um, to me, it was kind of shocking, a, um, a religious school for uh, children. You know, she, um, she attended school there. She said that um, when they did uh, anything wrong or bad, the um, staff people would slap their hands with the ruler or slap them on side the face with the ruler. They were small. Um, she said they couldn't speak their language. Sometimes they were punished like three to five hours. They had to kneel on the um, cement floor or tile floor. And she said they got blisters from the three to five hours that they had to kneel there on the floor for being punished. And um, she said a lot of the young uh, boys that tried to run away, when they brought them back, they would cut their hair and they would put them between two lines of boys and, and then the other boys had straps. They would strap them as they ran through that line a uh, punishment for, you know, for running away. Um, and she said, you know, even in, uh, while she was in high school, at the, also at the uh, religious school, the punishment still existed. And this was in the 60s. 
And I couldn't believe, you know, this was still going on. You hear about what happened in the late 1800s, you know, as far as in the boarding schools. But in the uh, 60s, it still went on, you know. I, um, today, you know, I'm appalled at some of the religious institutions, the U.S. government, how they treated as people, you know. No, no apologies, no, um, you know, reconciliation as far as, you know, we're sorry we did this to you and all this, you know. You know, we live with this, what they call historical trauma today as a result of that, you know. I, um, I even think back way before the boarding schools how my Omaha Indian people in uh, Northeast Nebraska were given um, blankets that were infested with uh, smallpox. Um, and at one time when the smallpox epidemic hit the Omaha tribe, we were numbered down to 300, 400 people. Today we're right roughly around 7,000, so we survived somehow by God's grace. But, um, you know, what happened to, you know, a lot of Native American tribes, not only here in Nebraska, but throughout the United States, you know, uh, you know, um, it's just, you know, really shocking to hear, you know, I wish there was more Native people sitting out there to, you know, hear what I'm sharing, you know, with you. Because today a lot of Native people don't share these stories unless, you know, uh, they talk among themselves as to, you know, what went on, you know, what went on in the uh, boarding schools. But I wanted to share that with you today, you know, that that happened. And I, I was really um, kind of shocked when this lady told me what had, what had gone on. I'm sure there was probably sexual abuse that went on, but she didn't talk anything about the uh, sexual abuse. But I um, wanted you all to know that. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm here, you know, and I, I want to show, tell you, you know, what really happened to our Indian children at various boarding schools. Uh, I wanted to say that Dr. Rudy's mother was in a documentary done by NET back in the 70s, and so there were two documentaries done. I think it was in The White Man's Image and in maybe in The White Man's Way. So it isn't as though Nebraska didn't have access to this. So why is it that today so few people still don't know what happened in Nebraska? And I really think it's um, time to tell these stories and tell the truth. And I always uh, go back to all the young girls and boys in America learn about Anne Frank and the atrocities of uh, what happened in Germany. But it hasn't been something that we want to tell here about what happened in America. And so that's one of the things that I want to see happen. And I'm going to work hard to find a way that these stories can become told so the young boys and girls, all children, can learn what happened in our country and that our Native children can feel a sense of pride that they are survivors, we are resilient people. And Dr. Rudy's uh, mother and my mother and all those people didn't suffer needlessly. And we're here to carry on and Dr. Rudy is a counselor. And I think that's probably a lot to do with ha helping heal. and. We're here to talk about healing, and I think because of America having for the first time a Native American woman as the Secretary of the Interior, that the light has been uh, shown on this topic. Otherwise, it would still be, we are invisible, out of sight, out of mind, we're not gonna talk about this. But Secretary Deb Holland, who I had the honor to testify in front of when she was a Congresswoman uh, about the Standing Bear trial, she has prioritized this, and so that brings us here today uh, as the co-chair of the Genoa Digitizing Reconciliation Project. We were a bit ahead of the curve three years ago, as Dr. Jacobs said. We started doing this work. Uh, now we've got to um, do more and do better, and what are we going to do? And I think that's some of what we're going to talk a bit about uh, today. I think People don't like to hear sad stories. People don't want to know about this. It, it isn't fun. We don't have a choice. This is, this is our life. We, we can't just pretend it didn't happen. This, this is who we are as Indian people. And we can um, celebrate all the great things. My t-shirt today is from Indigenous Peoples Day that we had for the first time in Nebraska, and I think you saw uh, evidence there that they did not kill the Indian, that the dance, song, ceremonies are still alive, and we are still here. 
too much of uh, what is taught in the schools and the dumbing down at Genoa, they were teaching us to be servants, not to be a doctor. We didn't have the potential or the wherewithal. So we can, with the right support, be anything that anyone can be. And I will use my own daughters as an example of the arc of my mother going to that school to my eldest daughter is an attorney, went to Columbia Law School, and she practices Indian law, water law. Yesterday, she was on a documentary program at the US Capitol about Standing Bear. And so I think my mother will be pretty amazed to, to meet my daughter and uh, the grandchildren. And Dr. Rudy has a very prolific family, Dr. Susan LaFleche Bacot and that whole family. The trial in the uh, Standing Bear trial was Dr. Susan's sister, Suzette. So those are the stories that need to be told and for all of us to learn, and our Indian children especially, so they can have positive role models. And we're not going to sit here and feel sorry for ourselves and continue to be victimized by this country. Uh, in America, it's a pretty white country, and if you don't want to, uh, if you're not white, you're given a role, and you better play the role you're given. Well, Dr. Rudy and I aren't going to play that role. We're going to say, we are warrior women, and he was a warrior in Vietnam. So with that, um, I want to uh, let Dr. Jacobs um, speak about our program or someone else here. I want to take a few minutes to introduce the work of the Genoa Indian School Digital Reconciliation Project. and. Um, despite everything we've heard this evening about the history and impact of the schools, there remain two pretty remarkable facts and challenges. The first, as we have heard um, appropriately so repeatedly this evening, is that many, many people still have no or limited awareness about the Genoa existed and the reality of the students and their families' experiences. The second fact and challenge is that access to records related to Genoa is difficult. The largest number of records exist in only a handful of locations in the United States, all of which are hours or days travel from locations in Nebraska, and within those repositories, the records are challenging to find. And these are clearly connected challenges. The limited access to the documentary record continues to enable lack of awareness, even though, as Judy has said, we have also been pretty willful in that lack of awareness, um, those of us who are white people and settlers. Um, and both of those challenges, the lack of awareness and access to the record, are stand in the way of, of truth and reckoning. So in response to these challenges, a team of us, many of whom are represented here this evening and many of whom are not, came together to establish and develop the Genoa Indian School Digital Reconciliation Project in 2018. The Genoa Project, online at genoaindianschool.org, is a space for telling the stories of the American Indian children who attend a Genoa, the stories of their communities, and the stories of their descendants. We're first digitizing government records from Genoa from various federal and state archives and hope that returning these records to American Indian families and tribes may be an act of archival reconciliation and of bringing history home. We aim also to support descendant communities in telling their stories of Genoa and to promote awareness and truth-seeking about the boarding schools among all Americans. Our team, let's see. Okay. Let me jump ahead. Okay, so our team is steered by com uh, Community Advisors Council, co-chaired by Judy Gayashkabash and James Ridingen, who are joined by representatives from the four tribes today headquartered in Nebraska. And partners on the project include the UNL College of Arts and Sciences and the UNL University Libraries, as well as the Genoa Foundation and Museum in Genoa, Nebraska, about which Margaret spoke earlier. So even prior, and we want to underscore the work of the foundation and museum as well, for even prior to the work of our digital reconciliation project, the foundation and museum had, had been working hard and continue to work hard to preserve the history of Genoa and its students through their care of the physical site and the hosting of reunions, among other activities. To date, the Genoa Digital Project team has published nearly 3,000 documents on our website, with another two to 3,000 documents yet to come. 
we present access to our materials for, through several topical areas, um, shown here and offset by the remarkable artwork of Winnebago artist Henry Payer, who has been an artist in residence here at the Center for Great Plains Studies, and who also designed the project's striking logo. Users can also search the documents to find records pertaining to specific individuals um, or by tribes. Each of the documents are richly described to account for every person named in the documents and every variation of a person's name and to provide an overview of the document and its purpose. A team of nearly 20 individuals has worked through UNL to digitize and describe the materials and to develop the technical infrastructure. A full list of the team members, both past and present, is available on the project website, but this evening I want to credit especially, in addition to the folks here today, current team members, Nicole Gray, Dalen Zagurski, Karen Dalzell, Katie Neeland, Greg Tunink, and Gabby Mace. Now the pandemic slowed our work due to repository closures, but also allowed us to pivot into some new directions on the project, including a deepening partnership with the National Indian School Digital, National Indian Boarding School Digital Archive, or NIBSDA. NIBSDA is an initiative of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, and our project team is both serving in an advisory capacity to NIBSDA as they build out the technical infrastructure and make decisions about a national digital archive and portal, and we are preparing our projects data for inclusion in NIBSDA um, under the guidance and with the approval of our community advisors. Participation in NIBSDA integrates the information we have prepared through the Genoa project with similar information related to other boarding schools from throughout the United States and will link users to the full content on the Genoa site. In addition to this work, team members and an extended network of researchers have also been involved, at other, involved in other especially critical and timely work, and that is what Margaret is going to speak about now. Uh, thank you again. Um, so these schools, as I hope you're gathering, have left a very complex and often painful legacy for indigenous people today. And similar institutions for children became the subject of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Stolen Generations Inquiry in Australia. Both of those, those nations have given formal apologies and issued monetary reparations to survivors of the schools. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware that just this summer, First Nations people in Canada found mass unmarked graves at a number of residential school sites. First Nations people in Canada have been talking about these graves for many years. They had told the Truth and Reconciliation Commission about them, but settlers had not believed them until ground-penetrating radar confirmed that Indeed, the sites did have many mass graves. The United States has held no such investigation or public inquiry into our boarding schools. Some states, however, have made some efforts. Just a couple weeks ago, the governor of Wisconsin, Tony Evers, apologized to his state's native peoples for the 11 boarding schools that existed in his state. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition that, that Liz mentioned is working for a national reckoning with the schools. They have lobbied members of Congress and the Secretary of the Interior to investigate the schools and hold a Truth and Healing Commission. As a result of their efforts, Representatives Sharice David of Kansas and Tom Cole, a Republican of Oklahoma, and Senator Elizabeth Warren have introduced a bill in both houses of Congress calling for a Truth and Healing Commission around the Indian boarding schools. And Secretary of Interior Deb Holland, herself a descendant of a boarding school survivor uh, from Laguna Pueblo, has called for an investigation into the schools, especially children's deaths and their burials in school cemeteries. So that has prompted us at the Genoa Project and at the Genoa Foundation and Museum in Genoa to do a very uh, deep dive into trying to find out what happened to the cemetery at Genoa and what happened to the children who died there and to try to identify all of them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Judy again to talk about um, that topic and kind of give you an update on that. 
okay, this is kind of a painful uh, part of my life. And as I have shared with uh, Dr. Jacobs, uh, when I come and do these things, it takes a while to go home and recover uh, from sharing. Uh, you know, they say you leave it on the field. Well, this is our personal life stories, and this isn't intellectual academic <clears throat> research for Dr. Rudy and I. So uh, a couple years ago when we were working on the project, I asked some hard questions. Uh, did any of those children die of suicide? What are the records showing? Uh, we weren't getting very good answers, and it's been a real challenge to find uh, hard evidence of what actually happened to the children. Going back to when I started going to the reunions 30 years ago, I met so many wonderful living descendants and learned a lot about what my mother's experience was like through their stories. And there was a big stone outside that was a memorial to those children that died there. And they had a plaque that had 19 children's names of children that we knew died at the school. Well, since then, through research of uh, Nancy Carlson, who runs the museum through her uh, grad student and through uh, Dr. Uh, Jacobs' student, I think it's a grad student, uh, the two of them have been doing a lot of research, and prior to today, we knew that there were an additional, I believe, 59 to the original 19. And the causes of death, unbelievable. Uh, we've got it all in a spreadsheet, and it tells the name of the child. And these children came from 40 different tribal nations. Some that died there were from the Blackfeet of Montana, uh, Winnebago, all over the United States. But they all didn't get sent home uh, when they died. We don't know where they are. They're missing in action. <laughs> these little soldiers are buried somewhere, and we're trying to find them. So that was pretty hard to absorb that, that there were more. We, I figured there were more. And we used to ask, where is the cemetery, when I'd go over there. And my daughters would go. And uh, they said, well, they didn't really know. And I know it's really hard for the people that live there in that community. That's their home. So I want to say on behalf of all of those people, I respect uh, my colleague friends that I've known for all these years, and they've seen my children grow up. So I want to say they've been good partners and that this collaboration wouldn't be happening if it weren't for the support of the museum and the Genoa Indian School. I uh, think that going forward, uh, yesterday or today, we found out that we have now um, up to 102 total children that we know died there, but we don't know where they are. So um, on Veterans Day, one of the things that our country prides ourselves in is always bringing our soldiers home. Whether it's 50 years later, 100 years later, you see these stories in the paper that someone brought the, their um, soldier home and did honored them. And so that's what we want to do. We want to find the cemetery, and we've had uh, in my official duties as the director of the Indian Commission, I am responsible per the Nebraska state uh, law that protects human remains. Nebraska was the first state to enact a law to protect, protect uh, Native American human remains based on the Pawnee battle with the uh, Historical Society. So Rob Bozell, the state archaeologist, and I, that's our official job to find those bodies. And so I'm here in that capacity as well as uh, serving on the advisory. But um, Rob has gone out twice now, and he has done uh, ground penetrating radar with another uh, specialist that does that. And we did it on one farm, the first farm, and we found um, no cemetery, no remains, uh, per the analysis that we got back. Just uh, this last week on Monday, they went out again and they did the canal adjacent to the first farm and another farm. Again, uh, from the initial findings, they couldn't find any differences in the soil, et cetera, that would lead you to believe that there were uh, bodies in, under the ground. So uh, now we know, as of uh, today, uh, Dr. Jacobs let me know, notified me that there were more, and boy, I think that's, we're gonna hear more, that there are probably more. And I, I feel so sad 
it's really heartbreaking and makes me feel so bad for those children that won't get to go to school and didn't get to have families and don't have grandchildren like I do. And we have to do better. Uh, Nebraska has to do better and America has to do better. And I don't think anything would be happening if it weren't for uh, Dr. Uh, Secretary Holland and this initiative. Uh, my colleague friend Suzanne Harjo, she has suggested that each of the schools be designated as a national memorial monument status and be uh, given federal funding. So I think that uh, Genoa and in Nebraska there needs to be some money allocated to retell the story and not have it be a whitewashed uh, candy coated version but tell the truth and I also think there needs uh, funding for language revitalization because uh, they were pretty successful in destroying our language. There aren't that many fluent speakers uh, for many of the tribes. So that's one thing I think that we could really see as a, a life-changing outcome because your language is who you are. And those people that immigrated to America and left their language and chose to do that willingly at Ellis Island and onward, some didn't. And you know, having diverse languages, that's a good thing. And diversity is a good thing. And respecting all of the different people in America, that's a beautiful thing. And that's why our men go to war, to protect this beautiful country. America is a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful place. But we don't want to be a cookie cutter uh, per American. I don't want to be an Indian of your imagination. I know who I am. I know who my people are, my relatives are. So I challenge all of you to learn your stories and to respect our stories and support our efforts and ask policymakers, what can you do? There's a lot you can do, all of you here. Your voice matters. You have more power than we do. You can call up or email your state senator, the governor, and say, what is Nebraska going to do about those missing children? If it were in any other place and you had 100 children that were buried somewhere and you couldn't find them, I think it would be on the front page uh, of the New York Times. And, you know, there's been this story going on with a young lady that sadly lost her life over in Wyoming and uh, the person that killed her was in Florida. All that focus on that one beautiful white girl. But we have a lot of Indian women in Wyoming that went missing and murdered Native women. And we continue to be di dying and trafficked because we aren't valued as much. Our women of color are just um, dismissed as not as important as mainstream societies. So that's, that's the reality of our country. And you all can stand up and say, that's not a good thing, that we want to do better. And we're going to stand with the women of color and all the people and do something here in Nebraska. So that's what I challenge you with, to go out and do something that makes a difference, that you can be proud of and leave a legacy that says, um, I chose to not stay in the dark and the truth will set us free. Are we getting close to the end? Oh, we're over time probably. <laughs> Susanna? Could Susanna? Oh, questions. Yes, questions. I could. I, you know, I did my master's program here, and um, I was the only Native American student to go through the, in my cohort um, in the graduate studies program. And um, when I wrote my master's thesis, I spent, I don't know, like almost a year working on boarding schools and uh, I remember every night, like, I, I cried, you know, learning and um, just reading that stuff. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd go through that every night, and then I'd come to school the next day, and then I would hear, like, you know, my peers talking about where they were going to have coffee the night, the, you know, that afternoon. And it was really hard to, you know, try to connect and, you know, get back into that world. And I was pretty traumatized, and it was really hurtful to go through that. And, I'm a historian, and being a Native American historian is really a painful thing to do, you know, I mean, because you have to learn all of that history. And I remember I had gotten to a point where 
um, you know, I needed to figure out a way how to reconcile with what I was doing and, you know, how I wanted to move forward as a Native American historian. And, you know, I started working at the digital project here and, you know, I felt like, okay, I just need to find those stories of resilience, you know, and I needed to look at history in that way. And um, I got to a point where, you know, I felt like I just couldn't get away from boarding schools and even, you know, being working for the digital project, you know, I'm going through these documents and I'm coming across my own family names and I'm coming across names of, you know, families of people I know and it was just a really hard thing to do and so, you know, I resolved myself that what I my purpose was was to help um, help bring those stories to life because all of those little people they need to have their stories heard and so I think that um, you know that's one of the reasons why I really hung in there with this project and I want to be able to talk about the project more here in a little bit but um, it's a pretty great one so yeah. questions questions This is audience participation time. <laughs> yes. Could you repeat? Sorry, the sir. When were the first Native American students allowed into the University of Nebraska and to Creighton University? I can say about UNL, I don't, I don't know that there was any uh, effort to bar Native students, but I recently met a man named Richard Williams, who's Lakota and Cheyenne. He lives in Denver, and he was the first Native student to graduate from UNL, I believe, in 1975. So that gives you an idea of, yeah. Um, you know, my second year in college was here at the um, UNL campus. That was in 1959. And um, I, like I said, I had transferred from Dana College in Blair because I couldn't get no scholarship or funding because it was a church school. So I had to go to a state-supported university. So I came down here. Um, it was interesting to come down because like myself going to a boarding school then coming to an all-white institution was another culture shock. You know, I joined the marching band. I was very fortunate. I, in high school, I played tenor sax, and I, I was accepted to the marching band here. But while I was in there, I looked around, and there was like 700 band members. I was the only dark-skinned person there. Civil rights wasn't even passed when I was going to school here. So that shows at that time, you know, maybe I was just a tokenism uh, person and all shit. But I, I've always wondered uh, throughout the years, you know, um, what happened at that time, you know, and somehow I got to be part of that marching band. But, uh, you know, I taught at Creighton. I retired in 2013. Um, as far as I know, there was no barriers as far as, you know, students going to school to church affiliated. Creighton is a very expensive school. Uh, Native people can't afford to go there. Uh, you know, a lot of the students are from upper middle class families that attend school there. But when I, I'm just going to briefly share something. When I was teaching, 99% of the non-Indian students that I had in my class, I had 40 students in my class, knew nothing about Native Americans. I would say, write on a sheet of paper what you know about Native Americans. They'd write on there. None saw them in movies, maybe on TV, but it was just mostly nothing that they knew about. So I had to start from ground zero in, in teaching uh, two classes there at Creighton. But I enjoy it. If I was younger, I would stay. But I want to retire and become lazy. <laughs> Other questions? I was just going to ask you because you're being in the band. Women would not be in the band until very recently. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> Can I ask when I was in college, you didn't consider. Yeah, that's very true. I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question in the, oh, here and then in the back. How did they reunite the children with the families? And were they, were the families accepting the kids to come back to their home? I think it varied from child to child. And there is no exact um, uh, 
boarding school experience. Everyone, just like we all, are unique human beings. So uh, that said, the children that stayed the longest and didn't get to go home, sometimes they might not go home for three years. Uh, some, the average became in the later years, they got to go home in the summer. But some were outed and, as Dr. Rudy said, worked out in homes that maybe where they were mistreated. There were stories I've heard where some of the children were treated well. But imagine that you've been away at school for several years and you go home and your parents don't speak English. And these are English-speaking schools. Some of the children went home and their parents couldn't understand the children and the children couldn't understand the parents. And I heard that from some of those uh, people that I met over the last 30 years and they're almost all gone. That um, it was really tragic and, and sad. So um, I, I don't think there's one answer to tell you. Uh, but a lot of them, like I said with my mother, she, they didn't kill the Indians. She went home and she worked for her uh, tribe. And uh, then when she came to Norfolk, she was a cultural mediator and helped the Indian people that um, moved to Norfolk. And uh, myself, I always tell the story that when my mother came to Norfolk, the only place we could, she could find housing was in um, a junkyard. Uh, the Henry Jones owned a junkyard. So I grew up in a junkyard. I'm a junkyard dog. And <laughs> uh, really, uh, I was up on the bottom of the totem pole. The black people were superior to us and we had high regard because our landlord was a black man and uh, he had um, very poor project housing that we lived in, these little shacks. Um, but that's just the way that was. And uh, I myself now, like Dr. Rudy, he's a counselor, I see myself as a cultural mediator, much like Dr. Susan LaFleche Picot was. She did a lot of things to help her people. And um, so what my mother learned there, how to live in two worlds and to how to help people, I saw that model. And I do a lot of that. And uh, mentor a lot of people and I know like Dr. Gabriel here is one of my board members and um, I've been fortunate to work with him and many of my board over the years uh, have gone on to be attorneys. One native girl is a judge in western Nebraska, Andrea Miller. There are lots of great success stories uh, that we can talk about and uh, Rick Williams when you asked about people going to school, Rick had a great grandmother that went to the Genoa Indian School and she came out of the school blind. A lot, there was a disease that a lot of the uh, children had <clears throat> and they had poor health care. And of those kids that died there, uh, let me tell you some of the causes of death. They uh, had died from heart failure, students. Do t kids today die of heart failure? Uh, accidental shootings. Are there guns at school uh, typically? I mean, sometimes now there are, but uh, let's see, what were some of the other reasons? Uh, Eating too uh, much. Tuberculosis, uh, uh, some kind of wound to the neck. I suspect some were committed suicide and some were hung. And some children were murdered at the school and beaten to death, et cetera. So it's uh, on those records, and we've got those. Uh, someone asked, could we give those um, death reports to the paper and I said uh, well that's part of our process we when someone dies you like to notify their family so until we can notify the families of these children that we just find, have found out it's not appropriate that we put that in the World Herald or anywhere else you know we've got to be respectful and that's the thing with our, our people we haven't been given respect we've been dehumanized Prior to Standing Bear, we weren't humans, and we still are treated with not a lot of respect. And people just really don't even think we live. But uh, the Ponca tribe was restored uh, in um, 1990, and they're alive and well and doing things. They have a prairie flower casino. They fought the state of Nebraska and Iowa a couple times in the Eighth Circuit, and they prevailed, and they succeeded, and they're doing well. Ho-Chunk Nation, the Winnebago tribe, they're doing wonderful things in Northeast Nebraska. The Omaha tribe, they're restoring the Dr. Susan LaFleche Hospital. That's another great success story. So there's a lot of work to do out there, and um, I don't know, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> but uh, this, those children that died, do you, don't you all find that pretty shocking that now uh, we can't find their bodies? They're buried somewhere in the ground. 
Well, hopefully soon. Susanna, you wanted to speak? Sure. Um, what I would like to add on to that is that, you know, people don't realize that when children, so when children were five years old, okay, so the agents, reservation agents, they kept track of everybody that lived on reservations. And once children were five years old, then they were looked, they were watched after very closely because by the age of six is when they were required to go to school. So you would have agents that would have sheets with all of the children that were five years old, you know, when those birth dates were, and then they would get ready to send them to school. And another thing is that, you know, school terms, they were not just one year terms, they were three to five year terms. And it was mandatory, it was law for children to be in school. So once your child hit six years old, then, you know, a lot of times, like just in the Genoa records that you see, you'll see these really blank applications, school applications. And so you would have like a reservation agent who would be communicating with the school and, you know, they would fill out this basic information and then you might see some correspondence where the school or, you know, the agent, the school would ask the agent to get a signature. And so once they were six years old, they went into school and it was maybe three years, maybe four four years that they were put they that they were required to attend school but as soon as their um, limit their term was about to expire then they would send out applications so it was just like an ongoing process and so you know children um, when you know if, if children were to be able to go home, then their families had to send a vacation request form to their reservation agent, and then it would go to the school, and then the school would have to send it off to the Commission, off, commission of Indian Affairs to get approved, and then send it back. But before um, a child was allowed to be released home, their family would have to submit uh, their transportation money which was $25 each way. So if you're figuring that families, um, you know, are already impoverished or, you know, they're waiting for their annuities and, you know, they don't have any money, then they're not getting their children back. So unless they provided transportation to and from school, their children were not going to be able to come back. And there are records in that we have found in for Genoa alone where, you know, like, for instance, I came across a record where there was a mother who was asking, you know, the school like what to do because their child was being bullied by some farmer kids and so they were concerned about their safety. And so the only recommendation that the school uh, gave the parent was, well then why don't you just, your, your child can come here and stay here, you know? And so, I mean, that was another way that a parent would lose their child, you know? And there were instances where if it was a mile, if or a half mile. So if you lived a half mile uh, from a school, then the school would consider, you know, uh, when the weather would get too bad, too dangerous in the winter, that it was, you know, too far for a student to walk. So then they would recommend that the student would come to the school and stay at the school. So there, I mean, ch you know, parents were losing their children regardless of, you know, what. And so also another thing about boarding school history is, you know, there's, there, there, there was a time when students had no choice. Families had no choice. After the Miriam Act of 1928, things started to lighten up, but it wasn't until 1978 uh, with the Indian Child Welfare Act that Native parents had the freedom to determine where their children went to school. So these are really important factors to consider, you know, when you're looking at boarding school history at how long parents had absolutely no choice um, of how long their students were going to stay in school. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is a question in the back. Um, Hi, first of all, I just want to ask my elders to excuse me for speaking before you. Um, you did answer my question. I was going to ask if it was true if your children didn't have, if your family didn't have enough money for you to come home, you had to stay at the, the school. You could not come home. Um, my great grandmother, my aunt and my uncle's grandmother, she was a student at um, Genoa boarding school. She did survive, so we're here today. Thankful for that. And um, I just want to say also when my grandmother, Elizabeth Sansasi, 
Stabler, and um, Charles Stabler moved here to, to Lincoln. When my grandfather, Lorenzo, was young, he came here when he was in fourth grade, and he went to a school over here on the university. The building is gone now. But um, they would not let him into school until he was 16. He said he went to school in fourth grade. He sat down in his chair. He was 16 years old. He never went back. He just got up and left with a fourth grade education. But he did go on. He's a veteran. He was in the Korean War. And um, basically, that's all I wanted to say. Let you know that information. Thank you. Weebla, huh? You know, uh, I just, when I was at Hasco, I, you know, my, like I said, my mother raised eight of us children. We were poor, I mean, very poor. So during Christmas time, I never came home. I stayed at the whole nine months at Hasco. Judy, maybe, I know you want to say something, but if you would close us with the poem. Okay. I think that might As be an healing. elder, I'm gonna put my glasses on. <laughs> to read this beautiful poem by Suzanne Schoenharjo, who received the Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. Children in the meadows and wetlands. There are children in the meadows and wetlands. Native children ran there to hide. When teachers pulled and butchered their hair, when teachers stole their medicine bags, when teachers collected their moccasins, when teachers dressed them in strange clothes, when teachers beat them with boards and belts, when teachers starved them for being bad Indians, the children ran to the meadows and wetlands. There are children in the meadows and wetlands, hostages who were taken to Haskell, who never saw their families again, who never saw mine, nine or 11 or tomorrow, who didn't make it home for summer vacations, who couldn't stop whooping and coughing, who couldn't learn English fast enough, who couldn't fall to their knees often enough. They ran till they fought, fell in the meadows and wetlands. There are children in the meadows and wetlands, hostages who were taken to, to Chilaco, where they ran from teachers, fists and boots, where they ran from bounty hunters' cages, where they ran home from high collars and hard shoes, where they ran from lye soap in their mouths. where they ran from day and night, where they ran until wolves outran them. Their teeth are in the meadows and wetlands. There are children in the meadows and wetlands, hostages who were taken to Carlisle and Genoa, who got to build the school buildings, who got Christian burials without coffins, who got a mass grave with their friends, who got plowed under for a football field, who got embedded in concrete for the stadium, who got to be the practice site for the Washington Redskins because they ran to the meadows and wetlands. There are children in the meadows and wetlands. Native children ran there to hide. You can see their clothes in museums. You can see their pipe bags at the opera. You can see bands marching on their hallowed ground. You can see mascots dancing over their dead bodies. You can imagine their hair long and beautiful again, safe from teachers and scissors at last, these children in the meadows and wetlands. Suzanne Schoenharshaw. Thank you, Judy, for sharing that with us. I'm sure many of you are wondering what actions you might be able to take personally after tonight's um, discussion. And uh, our panelists have provided us with some direction for um, some actions that we may take individually. I think it's time that we thank our panel for helping us all to understand this history, this very hard, dark history that is part of our shared past together. And I'd like to thank the panelists for being open and honest and vulnerable and sharing so much. Thank you. <laughs>